The phenomenon of channeling is ancient. From earliest times, it has been found in all cultures, even though it has been called by different names. Some of these include shaman, witch doctor, healer, medicine man, fortune teller, oracle, soothsayer, saints, mystics, prophets. In esoteric schools, they are called lightworkers, initiates, teachers, adepts. In our own modern day, the terms medium and channel are more popular. However, there is one field that is not very accepting of what mediums and channels have to offer, and that is the profession of mainstream psychology and psychiatry. And I can cite personal experience on this note. When I was involved in graduate school in a program in professional counseling from which I graduated in 2014, I can recall only one professor who was accepting of my worldview about the cause of and proper treatment of mental health issues. I don't like to call them disorders. I had to study the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, both volumes four and five, and learn how to diagnose people. The first red flag for me was when I learned that if I did not diagnose a client on the first visit, then insurance would not pay for the visit. I really began to question whether or not I wanted to be part of the counseling profession at that point. I had begun to speak openly about being a psychic medium and about channeling. And every time I had to write a paper about diagnosis and treatment of mental illness, I would suggest holistic treatments and suggest that psychotropic medications were harmful and dangerous. I even had several reference books on how to use kundalini yoga in the treatment of psychiatric disorders, and I would write about this in my papers. I also relied heavily on the theories of Carl Jung and the collective consciousness idea. So for this reason, cognitive behavioral therapy and those modalities that were tied into behaviorism did not appeal to me at all, because I don't believe that people are effectively treated in this way for issues that I believe many times have a spiritual etiology. I only had one professor that was grudgingly accepting of this, and she would refer to me as her holistic student. Most of the other professors didn't say a lot, but I could tell they were rolling their eyes behind the scenes. So after I spent all that time and money, I decided to go the route of hypnotherapy training and energy work instead. And I started to develop my psychic abilities and studied more about the spirit realm and spirit releasement therapy. I realized that the mainstream mental health industry would look upon someone like me as delusional, suffering from dissociative identity disorder, psychotic, or worst of all, a fraud. I used to joke with my son about this and tell him, don't let anybody convince you that I need to be locked up because I talk to dead people. I must say, however, things do seem to be changing slowly. When I saw a new young doctor for a physical and she took a history of me, I told her what I do. She was fascinated and told me that she would love it if I would give her some resources on mindfulness and meditation and that if I ever wanted to start a group, she could refer uh, clients to me. She didn't even flinch when I told her I was a medium or when I explained that I had a kundalini awakening that started all of it and experienced a lot of physical healing as a result of that awakening. So I guess there is more hope that acceptance is taking place and I never have a lack of people who want me to do readings for them. But obviously the mental health industry places absolutely no emphasis on the fact that the phenomenon of phenomenon of channeling is ancient and has existed in one form or another in most cultures of the world. If we look back at a preliterate, pre-primitive culture um, era, we see that most included beliefs about the acceptance of a non-physically based spirit or soul as the essence of people. Animists and shamans accepted this was also true of animals, plants, and even inanimate things like mountains and stars. They also believed that the spirit or soul survived physical death and that these discarnate beings could be communicated with. This usually looked like ancestor worship, belief in and communication with various forces of nature, and with gods that personified aspects of nature and human nature. Shamans use various techniques to receive information about how to heal. 
In addition, they used altered state activity and mystical states while communicating with sources that were beyond physical reality and the human mind. Over my years of teaching, I had many students of the Hmong culture, and if you're not aware, that's spelled H-M-O-N-G, and these people originate from a tribe in Laos, and the United States government used the Hmong people in the fighting of the Vietnam War, and that's a, another story in itself, how these people were used by the U.S. military to fight the war in Vietnam, but the end result of this was that when Vietnam, when we lost the Vietnam War, when the United States lost the Vietnam War, many of these people came to the United States and the United States took them in because we owed them a, a debt for helping us to fight in the Vietnam War. So I've had many students of this culture and I learned a lot from these students about how their culture practiced shamanism. The Hmong religion is traditionally animist, which means they believe in the spirit world and interconnectedness of all things. According to Hmong cosmology, the body is host to a number of souls, and the isolation and separation of one or more of these souls from the body can cause disease, depression, and death. Curing rites are called soul-calling rituals. Whether the soul departs the body because it was frightened out of the body or it was kidnapped out of the body, it must be restored to the person if health is to be restored. So at the center of Hmong culture is the shaman. Not just anyone can be a shaman. A shaman is called to be a shaman. It is a great honor to be called to this profession, and oftentimes the calling comes in the face of some initiatory experience or even illness that the person suffers. The shaman is the intermediary between humans and the invisible spirit realm. He or she performs chanting, singing, and dancing to reach the altered or trance state needed for channeling. In addition, the rituals also involve sleep deprivation, fasting, smoking herbs, hyperventilating, or ingesting psychoactive plants. The shaman, upon reaching the trance state, mounts a wooden bench during the ritual, and this is symbolic of riding into the spirit world. If the shaman falls off the bench during the ritual, he or she will die. Oftentimes, the shaman goes into the spirit realm to reclaim a lost soul or a part of a soul. One way in which a shaman returns the soul to the body is through a string tying ritual. White, red, black, or blue strings are tied to shield the person from evil spirits in the form of sickness. These strings signifying the signify the binding up and holding intact of the life souls in the person. I read an interesting book about this called When the Spirit Catches You, You Fall Down. It was about a Hmong family in California who got in trouble for practicing traditional shamanic practices on their child. The child had epilepsy, but according to the family, this was the result of the child's spirit being frightened out of her body. The shaman's job was to find the spirit and return it to the girl. So the family refused traditional medicine and treatments for the little girl, and Child Protective Services continued to try and remove the girl from the home. Eventually, as the family refused to give the required medication and treatment for the little girl, unfortunately, she died from a seizure. And this was one instance where the question arose of what takes precedence, the rights of the child or the religious rights of the parents. Hmong shamanism represents only one example of how channeling is used and has been used among people of all continents and all races. Here's another example which comes from a field anthropologist in Africa. The anthropologist describes a typical scene in which evil spirits are expelled and good spirits invited to heal a person's nervous disorder. The Arifa, or ceremony leader, dragged a half-paralyzed woman into the courtyard. The music suddenly gave a leap into a space out of this world, as if under the influence of, invisible, of an invisible helper. The possessing spirit shook her fragile frame like a gale in a winter tree, twisting and bending her until a spark of life and vitality rushed through her paralyzed limbs. In Bali, the shaman is known as Pedanta Siva. The shaman does breathing and chanting exercises along with bell ringing, flower throwing, and ballet-like movements. The Akawayo Indians of Guyana, South America also practice shamanism. The shaman is taught by his Yula Doi, or partner, who according to tradition may be either incarnate or a ghost teacher.
the shaman's job is to attract sympathetic spirits and ghosts to talk with them and engage them he is thought to be able to contain a number of discarnate entities at one time one native describes the abilities of the shaman this way even if joe's spirit is in his body other spirits can still come down and be inside him this sounds a lot like spirit releasement therapy Spirit releasement therapy is gaining in acceptance in modern times, although I have found not as much in the United States as in the UK. The examples I have given of shamanism are just a few. There are many, many more. At the center of the story of what channeling is and what it has to tell us is that throughout history, cultures have seen the odyssey of the human spirit as a slowly evolving entity that survives death and operates within far more than just the physical realm. And with this comes the belief that other non-human beings also exist in other dimensions and are capable of communicating with this.